Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. We're going to continue where we were uh, yesterday, looking at these verses moving from uh, 29 to 30. So we're looking at the historical application. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for all that you do in our lives and for the things that you teach us from your word and the faith and confidence that you uh, give us in what you are doing. We yield our lives to you. We ask that we can trust in you, that you can guide and direct us in the decisions that we make each day, and that you can guide and direct this study, uh, that we can understand these things correctly. We know some of the things that we are seeing are different uh, than we had seen before, but we know, Lord, it is in accordance with the teachings of the past. So be with us now as we open your word together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again, everyone. So yesterday was kind of interesting for me, at least in the study, because what we've started to see is that Daniel 11 verse 40 is referenced within uh, the preceding verses of Daniel chapter 11. And this actually makes way more sense to me. When we go back to this, the Battle of Actium, right, it's going it, to, it's, uh, so we so we have the Battle of Actium, and then we're going to have, uh, we're going to go back and give the background about this, I, I don't know if you call this a league, but I guess it's a type of league, it's an alliance between Antony and Octavian that's not going to stand. And then it's going to talk about uh, the time appointed. For yet, and we, we, so that's like in the middle there on the, the, the word yet 5750, which means an iteration is that same word that says within 65 years. So within, sometimes it's translated as that and sometimes yet. The idea is it's something that's a repetition or that is going to repeat. It's going to, to occur. Um, or it's a continuation of something. So, so yet, the end shall be at the time appointed. So it's pointing us to this time appointed. And that time appointed, we see in Daniel, it's the Moed. Uh, and it would refer to the end of the prophetic periods, not to the end of the 360 years, as Uriah Smith would apply it. And then it says, then shall he, the king of the north, return into his land, which we're saying is Rome, with great riches. So it's going to go so it's comparing what's happening here at the at the end of that 360 with what's going to happen at the time point. So it's saying, even though we have this 360 years, even for a time, and we have these events that are going to uh, begin with the Battle of Actium, that this is typifying something that's going to happen. And then we see pagan Rome. So instead of like swearing in, putting this as Octavian, it's obviously pagans Rome heart shall be pagan Rome's heart shall be against the holy covenant and he shall redo he shall do and return to his own land right at the time appointed so again we come to this time appointed and we say here that it's going to refer to november 9th 1989 he the papacy in the usa king of the north shall return and come toward the south but it shall not be as the former or as the latter and we're going to look at this a little bit more. And then in verse 30, uh, we're going to look at this because um, there's some interesting things about this verse. OK, so when it comes to the to the time appointed, we're saying that this is pointing to uh, 1798 and 1989. That is the time appointed is the time of the end. Can can we agree with that? That would seem to be logical. Yeah, it seems yeah, based on all the, all the comparisons we did with time appointed and the time of the end, they seem to be pointing to a period that happens at the time of the end. So the time of the end to the time appointed. In some ways, it's not just one um, period, like one one date. It actually is sort of referring to a period of time within these dates. So it says at the time appointed. So we're saying that this here 
is the time appointed where the king of the north comes against the king of the south. And that's going to be Daniel 11, verse 40b. But we know the time appointed can also refer to 1798. And then what we have to address is this lat, this former and the latter. I know I'm not doing a good job sort of framing this. If somebody just came into the study right now, they wouldn't really understand what we're talking about. But we have these events. So let's, let's go back because I, I want this to be clear. So when we looked at uh, 23 and 24, you're going to have this span of time, 666 years. And it's going to go from when they have this league, the Roman Jewish League, 161 to 158 BC. And from 158, we count 666 inclusive years to 508. And this is from Miller. And, and we took this even for a time, this 360 years, and we did two applications of it. And the one goes from 48 BC, August 9th, to June 13th, 313 AD. That's the Edict of Milan. The other one goes from the Battle of Actium, September 2nd, 31 BC, to May 11th, 330 AD, and that's Constantinople. That's Rome moving the capital to Constantinople from the city of Rome. And that's when it's dedicated, right? So we have these spans of time, and there's all kinds of structures in there. And what it's going to do, uh, uh, Daniel chapter 11, is it's going to um, give it, it keeps repeating and enlarging. So after they deal with, with that history, they're going to go back to this alliance between Octavian and Antony. Right. They're going to have this. They have this alliance. Now, that's going to be a bit later. But before that, in verse 25, they're going to talk about this battle. And, and right now we're ignoring the present truth application. We know that we can we can apply it in the present truth. We're just looking at the historical application. And so um, so we have a battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. So that's going to be the battle of acting. And in that battle, the North is going to defeat the South. And in 30 AD, Egypt will be totally uh, under Roman control, right? That's, that's what we saw. And we went through those, um, those verses dealing with the portion of his meat and Antony's suicide. And then we have a type of the Sunday law. We see Octavian's army shall overflow. And, and we can see the parallel then to Daniel 11, verse 40b, and the Sunday law that follows, right? We should be able to see that. And then it, then it goes back again, and it gives us more detail, right? So it repeats and enlarges. It deals with this agreement that fails. And, and so this, I mean, this, this is earlier history, obviously before the Battle of Actium. So Octavian and Antony, they both desire to control the Roman world. That's what we, we understand it. Uh, it shall be in these kings' hearts to do mischief, in both of these kings' hearts. And they have, in their personal ambition, when they have this agreement, they're speaking lies. And at one table, so a table is like a table of fellowship, of a meal, like a fellowship meal. And then it says, it, it shall not pr pr prosper, for certainly yet... So, or certainly yet, that is certainly, that's the word that's translated for, which should be translated as certainly, and yet means an iteration. So certainly it shall repeat, the end shall be at the time appointed, the Moed. And we're saying that that's the end of the prophetic periods. Then he, that's going to be the king of the north, return into his land with great riches. So now it's going to go back just to, what happens after 30 and 31, 31 and 30 BC. And then it says his pagans, pagan Rome's heart shall be against the Holy Covenant. So obviously that can't be Octavian because the Christians don't exist yet. And we know that this Holy Covenant has to be a reference to, to the Christians. And it says, and he shall do and return to his own land. So that means just as they conquered Egypt, Right. He's going to return to his own land. And then there's going to be this program against Christianity. So this is going to refer to 
of the persecution that happens to Christian, Christians. And then he returns to his own land. And then it's going to bring us back to the time appointed. At the time appointed, and we're saying, now here, this is going to be November 9th, 1989. This isn't going to be 1798. So we say, well, the time appointed is the end of the prophetic periods. But are, is the time of the end in 1798 connected to the time of the end in 1989? They're both the time. What's that? It should be. Yes. So they're definitely connected. They're one verse, Daniel 11, verse 40. And so they're, they're the same history, but there's one is, is a repeat of the other history. So we're, we're in that repeat of history of Millerite history. But it's built into Daniel chapter 11, because what we have here is that this time appointed, we're not going to have the king of the south, you know, push against the king of the north. We're having the king of the north shall return and come toward the south. And in this case, this would be the USSR. And the king of the north is the papacy in the USA. But it shall not be as the former, so um, or as the latter. Now, the former, this is the word Rishon. It's related to the word uh, Rosh. Rosh means head at first or chief. Bereshit, the first word in the Bible, means in the beginning, right? Rishon just means uh, the first. And and so, in, in a sense, in a point of time. So something that happens formerly. That's why it's translated as former. It shall not, he, it shall not be as the former. Now, we're saying that the former is the fall of Egypt in 30 BC. Then we, when it came to, or as the latter, now we could go back to the previous verse and say, well, the latter is going to be when the Christians are going to be persecuted, right? So that's one option. We could say, well, the former and the latter, if we look at the preceding uh, two verses, it's going to be talking about, you know, what happens with the fall of Egypt and then what happens uh, with the Christians being persecuted. But we've chosen not to, to parallel the latter with that one above. We say the fall of Rome in 476 to 508. And it's the next verse that gives us the clue that that's what it's referring to. So any questions about that so far? So we're going to look at the next verse. But we can see that that somebody could look at this and say, well, there's the former and the latter, and there are two events mentioned earlier one that's former and one that's latter and and so it could be referring to it's not going to be what's going to happen at the time of the end it's not going to be like you know when egypt is con- conquered and it's not going to be like when the christians are persecuted right so that's a possibility and i'm not dismissing that but we chose that the latter is going to refer to the fall of rome okay any questions so well i'm saying that the latter is going to be what's mentioned next. So when we go to verse 30, it says, now in the King James, it's going to have the word for, for it says, for the ships of, of Kittim shall come against him, right? Now, I looked at the Hebrew, and there is a word there that's not numbered or translated in Strong's. And it's the word boo. It's, it's a bat and a vav. And there's a dot on it, which gives it a new sound rather than an O sound. So it's, it's, um, and it's best translated as in which it, it, it's really the word kind of the word in with, with, um, a plural, uh, a plural masculine ending, right? Cause, cause normally a bet means in, right? Just like in a house, right? But here it's going to have this plural ending. And so the best way to translate this from what I can understand about Hebrew is to translate it as in which. That for is is okay, but in which, uh, what it's saying is it's referring back to what is the latter. So when it says it will not be as in the former or as the latter, in which the ships of Kitten shall come against him. And that is going to refer to the fall of Rome. Even if we didn't put in which in, in which in there, and we just had four, we could see that four would also lead to that conclusion. For the ships of Kittim shall come against him. 
But here, the in which, that word that's left untranslated and unnumbered in Hebrew, actually connects it, saying that this ladder is this thing that we're going, that we're, that we're now talking about. And we know that the ships of Kittim, that this is referring to the Germanic tribal invasions that come against, uh, Western Rome. Now, another thing that's kind of interesting, uh, the word ladder, one way it can be translated is, is the, is the word Western. Now, why would ladder be, uh, why would the word Western mean ladder? Or why would ladder mean rest Western? Can you think why? Ladder is referring back to something. It's got to be referring back to something. Well, it means something that's after, right? So the sun sets oh, yeah. in. Yeah, right? that's what I, yeah, that's what I that's what I meant. Yeah. So the sun sets in the west, and and so that's why the word ladder, the latter part of the day, or the western part of the day, right? When the sun is in the west, it's probably at least that's my guess of why, uh, why it's sometimes translated as western. But the idea here is we have Western Rome as well. So this is going to be the fall fall of Western Rome, not the fall of Eastern Rome, right? When we talk about the fall of Rome, we always talk about the fall of, of Western Rome, 476. Eastern Rome is still going to be going on until whatever it is, uh, you know, 1440. Um, what is it? When's the, can't think of the, the guy. Anyway, yeah, 1449 in there, in 14. <laughs> Anyway, with the fall of Constantinople, uh, so that's going to be four years after 1449. So 14, uh, 14, 14, what is, what is the year? 1453. Is, I think that's when Constantinople falls. Anyway, so does this make sense now that, that, that the former is what happens when Egypt is conquered and the latter happens when Rome is conquered and and then we have to say, well, why are they comparing, the, comparing these two? Why is there the comparison? Why are they going to say it's not going to be like the former or the latter? So we know that it's similar, right? Because that's what it's saying when it says it's, it's an iteration of, of this. These events are typifying what's going to happen at the time appointed. But it's not going to be the same as what happens with the fall of Egypt or the fall of Rome, in which, so with the fall of Rome, the ships of Kittim are going to come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. Now, we can see that there is some connection between the fall of Rome, Rome itself, and what has happened uh, as far as the Holy Covenant here. So if we go back to verse 28, then shall he, the king of the north, return into his land with great riches, right? He comes from Egypt and his pagan Rome's heart shall be against the holy covenant, right? So we know that, that there is a connection between the persecution of the Christians and the fall of Rome. And then it says that he shall do and return into his own land. So there is a connection there, but the, the specific thing that they're going to refer to is is Rome itself that it's going to fall. And so when he when um these Germanic tribes come in against Rome, Rome is going to be grieved. And then it's going to return. So it keeps returning and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So we're saying that this is paganism trying to destroy Christianity. So this is persecution. So it's going back to that persecution so shall he do and then it says he shall even return and i'm saying that the he now is the papacy and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant now we could say that this is actually rome not the papacy so maybe i'm just going to put this as rome shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So we're going to have paganism, that is, pagan Rome. And so them that forsake the Holy Covenant would be the papacy. So I'm going to have it this way, and we'll say pagan Rome. So pagan Rome is going to become papal Rome. And that's verse 30, right? And we know verse 31 is 
the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate. The thing that I really like about this interpretation is how this story flows into the rise of the papacy. Because otherwise there is just a jump. But here the story flows much more logically. Actually, almost everything before now makes it, 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 it connects to what's happening. And it's all bringing us up to the time of the end. I don't know. I didn't explain any of this very well, but uh, any comments on it? No, no thoughts about this? No thoughts? I need some thoughts on this because this is pretty radical. Cover that again, please. Okay. So what we're saying is we know the time of the pointed and the time of the end are connected. Correct. And we know that there is a time appointed or a time of the end in 1798. And there's one in 1989. And that what these verses are telling us is that these events that are connected with this even for a time, that is uh, the beginning of that 360 years with the Battle of Actium, and the events that are going to happen with uh, the capital moving from Rome to Constantinople, that they are typical of something. And the thing that they're going to be typical of is um, events at the end of time. But those events at the end of time are going to have some different characteristics. That's why they're not going to be as, and that's what we have to discuss in more detail, is what specifically, why does it say it shall not be as the former, that is the fall of Egypt in 30 BC, or as the latter, the fall of Rome, right? So that's, so we got the former and the latter. And then we're going to say, well, the latter is going to be described in verse 30, and in which the ships of Kittim shall come against pagan Rome, therefore he shall be grieved and return. So we have all of these returnings. So it's similar in that he returns, and he's going to have indignation against the Holy Covenant. Paganism is going to try to destroy, destroy Christianity again. But he shall return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. That is, in this history, the way that, that Christianity is going to be destroyed is by mixing with apostate Christianity, right? Paganism just morphs into papalism, right? So there's a difference in which these, these events, they typify these events at the end of the world, at the time of the end. But, but the time of the end is different as well. So, what I'm saying is that this this whole story is flowing all the way from, right, so we have the crucifixion of Christ. When we go back here, we're going to have uh, Rome is arising. It's going to be the power that's going to crucify Christ, right? That's why, you know, Greece and Egypt and all these different kingdoms, they're, they're preceding Rome, but Rome is going to cause the crucifixion of Christ. That's why it has to exalt itself to establish the vision because this vision and and the prophecies that are being talked about here are the prophecies of the daniel eight and nine specifically and especially with the crucifixion of christ is daniel 9 verse 26 and 27 so you're going to have the persecution of christians and uh, the destruction of the sanctuary in the city of jerusalem right it goes back and it talk, talks about this league and why this league leads to the destruction of Jerusalem and to the persecution of Christians uh, that are going to end in at even for a time. So we have two different dates, uh, 31 AD, the Edict of Milan, and 33 AD, the, um, <clears throat> the movement of the capital of Rome from Rome to Constantinople. And then it's going to uh, go back and it's going to talk about the Battle of Actium. So it's going to give us more detail about that first, the beginning of that time, right? 31 AD or BC, pardon me, the beginning of that period of 360 years. It's going to give us that history and, and ultimately the defeat of Egypt, which then becomes part of the Roman Empire. And then it, and then it even goes back to before that, this agreement that they had, that they're going to speak lies at one table. And it's using this as a type of what's going to happen at the time appointed. 
that is at the time appointed, there is going to be um, these types of leagues, right, at the end of the prophetic periods. And then it has the king of the north returning into his own land. That's after the defeat of Egypt. And then he's going to persecute Christians. He's going to have his heart against the holy covenant. And then he's going to persecute. That's his doing. And then he's going to return into his own land again. And then it talks about at the time appointed. So this time appointed is not the end of the 360 years. It's the end of the prophetic periods. But in this time, it's specifically referring to November 9th, 1989, because in November 9th, 1989, we have the king of the north defeating the king of the south. So that's going to be Daniel 11, verse 40b, where earlier it talks about the time appointed. That's going to be Daniel 11, verse 40a. And then it says, November 9th, the papacy in the USA, the king of the north, shall return and come toward the south. That's going to be the Soviet Union. So here, already what we see in Daniel 11, verse 40, is being talked about. It's giving us this background. And it's going to talk about it again in, in Daniel 11, verse 40. But but here, it's it's specifically referring to it. It's not another application. This is what is being referred to. And then it says, at the time appointed. It's not going to be as the former, which is the fall of Egypt in 30 BC, connected with the Battle of Actium. Or is the latter. Now, the latter is, of course, this persecution of Christians, but more specifically, the fall of Rome, because it says, for the latter is that in which the ships of Kittim shall come against pagan Rome, right? This is going to be the fall of pagan Rome. Now, maybe what we could say here maybe is Western Rome. Uh, I'm going to use that because that's really what's going to be being talked about. Therefore, he shall be grieved. And, and if we look at that word uh, latter, I'm just going to put it up here, also Western. So, so we have Western Rome falling. So the Germanic tribes come against Western Rome. And therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So this is referring to the pagan persecution of Christians that's going to happen in that period of time. So paganism is seeking to destroy Christianity. And then it says, so shall he do. So again, we have this, this doing, right? This, which we haven't really addressed in too much detail why they use this expression. That is he, pagan Rome shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And the ones that forsake the Holy Covenant is papal Rome. So. Maybe that's what we will put there instead of papacy, even though it's the same thing. So you've got papal Rome. Now, we're going to see that that's what's going to be talked about right in the next verse, verse 31. Because right? that's going to be Clovis. Uh, the arms shall stand on his part on behalf of papal Rome. and They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, remove paganism, corrupt earthly church. Uh, with false doctrine, you serve Christ's intercession in heavenly sanctuary. Now that this is swearing and stuff, and and I don't agree with him quite there. Um, I don't know if that's the best way to put it, because that sounds more like the new view of the daily. But anyway, he shall take away the daily, that is, remove paganism, turn people's hearts away from Christ's intercessory ministry. So again, you can see stuff there from swearing in. And they shall place the abomination that make maketh desolate, set up the papacy and power over the church, state, and conscience of Christians in 538. And such as do wickedly against the covenant, those who turn against the gospel through recantation, shall he, the papacy, the next king of the north, corrupt by flatteries, flatter the prospects uh, with flatter with prospects of position and material gain, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Faithful followers of God will remain faithful, preach the truth, and win many true converts. So this is this is uh, swearing games. We haven't edited that. But the basic idea is there. We did put Clovis being baptized on December 25th, 508 in there. Okay. Do we see how this logically flows now? Does that help, Dwight? Dwight? Yeah. Does that help? A bit. Okay. Because I think that there's a... A much more logical flow of the prophecy the way that we have 
come to understand it. We're having to look at this different from many that have come before us. As as I had looked last night when when I was out after taking care of a job, I had stopped by a used bookstore. Mm-hmm. I had run into a copy of a book that's still widely published within the church. And the way that we're looking at this is is entirely different than what we're seeing and had seen in the past presented by people such as Roy Allen Anderson, mm-hmm. who had been the A of Frida of the um, Questions on Doctrine Infinite. Yeah. Well, I know I read Roy, Roy Allen Anderson's books when I first became an Adventist, and it definitely uh, created a lot of confusion for me. I would agree. Yeah. So much of, of what's going on right now, especially in, in other portions of applications of these prophecies, are also not making sense because there's just too much attempts at time setting even when they're not attempting to place a specific date. So well, what what I see is that futurism has taken over Adventism. And futurism has infected many parts of this movement. Yes. And and that was, you know, always my concern um, with the way that people were attempting, like even, you know, what we had with July 18th. I mean, I tried my best to, well, one is I didn't want to be, look like I was opposing the movement. So I was um, trying to be wise as a serpent, as but as harmless as a dove, right? I mean, I, I was not trying to tell people what to think. But I knew that the way that Parminder, for instance, was approaching time setting was, was wrong. Right. That Tess is the way that she was approaching uh, time setting. And that is we kept looking at it as if these are the events of the of the Sunday law that are that are before us instead of understanding that our line was typical. And and that we could not time set against Ellen White's uh, clear counsel. Right. So we have clear counsel against time setting. And so how could we possibly set dates? Well, the only way that we could do that is if we were in a typical line and that the dates that we were setting were not the actual events, but types of those events. So what what Jeff used to be fighting against was those false ideas, the false applications of scripture. But it seems like the movement now cannot. It has no bearing. It's lost. It's lost its way and is just haphazardly making applications. So when we look at Daniel 11 in this way, so first we we get the historical application correct. And we can see in this historical application, it is referring to events in our time. That is, we, we haven't done a present truth application to get November 9th, 1989 in these verses. We're saying that that time appointed in verse 29, is referring to November 9th, 1989. Okay. And, it's to, and it's going to compare the events here in, in this history of Rome to the events at the end of the world. Because the time appointed can't refer to something in in uh, Roman and, uh, you know, pagan and papal Roman history specifically. I mean, it can refer to the end of, of papal Rome. 1798, but the time appointed is can't be the end of the 360 years because it, it definitely is the time of the end. And that time of the end is something that happens after pagan and papal Rome. And, and it's comparing these. So to me, this is just so, so logical. I mean, I know I'm not doing a good job explaining it because it, these are pretty new ideas to us, but it just flows so much better. Everything just moves logically right from the beginning of chapter 10 all the way to all the way to the end of chapter 12. There is a logical thread that is tying everything together where before we never had that. 
Daniel chapter 11 used to seem directionless to me. It was like we just picked a verse and said, what history does this apply to? And 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 there was not a a narrative or a story that tied it all together. It was just like random events out of history were chosen to be written about, but with no purpose in mind, as if it was just, you know, we just need to know that this history happened, but for what purpose? You know, why? Where is it leading? And and now I can see that it's it keeps referring back to the prophecies of Daniel chapter 9 and to Daniel chapter 8. And then it keeps showing us where we're going, why, why we're even looking at this history at all. Now, we could say, well, the Battle of Actium is important, but there's lots of battles, right? I mean, there's there's lots of things that could be chosen from history to write about in Daniel chapter 11. But the things that here are being chosen, they're being chosen because they illustrate something. And, and what they're illustrating is the end of the world. So when Ellen White says the history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated, that's actually what Daniel chapter 11 is about. It's about a history that's going to be repeated. And it's telling us that all through chapter 11. So for me, I mean, I just, I'm just amazed that we didn't notice this before. There is, there's a lot that as we have been going through this, that we're finding that is very different from what others would consider. Yeah, but but we have a reason why, and that reason has to do with, um, first, we're following Miller's rules, but we also have a framework in which to understand these things, and that's line upon line. Okay. Right. So so the line upon line has really helped us, and what, what we see right now in the movement and, and, and I don't, you know, I don't have anything against Jeff personally, and I definitely am not like, but when I look at his, his interpretations, the word that I would use, and I don't, I don't like even saying it, but it's, it's, it's haphazard. It's willy nilly. It's, there's no, there's no continuity and he's picking and choosing different things. It's not logical. There isn't a, Things just don't follow from the premises. Nothing is, is moving. It's it, like we're just picking events from, from the present. The things that Jeff has always condemned people doing in trying to study prophecy, he is now doing himself. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and I, I have specific reasons for saying that. Yeah, okay. Now, yeah. yeah. One- one thing, and this is, I know, a segue away from what what we're addressing here right now. Mm-hmm. News report just came through that uh, the Supreme Court has basically stated that the states don't have the legal right to kick Trump off the ballot. That the only way that this legally can be done is if it goes through Congress. Right. Yeah. Well, so that just that just was just decided now. It just came through. Yeah. And the other thing that was interesting about this, this was an unsigned opinion. So the those of the Supreme Court didn't want to put their name on it. Oh. Okay. So they can do that, just not sign it. Yeah. Well, it's a unanimous ruling, according to the news here, 13 minutes ago. Okay. It's interesting to me that the states cannot invoke a post-Civil War constitutional provision. So we're addressing this again in in light of what had happened with the Civil War. Right. So it, so with the Civil War, because that was really about the Civil War. Right. People that were involved in the Civil War could not hold office or run run for office. That was actually the whole intent of that amendment right right correct it had nothing to do with something in the future right it was a civil war amendment that that was my understanding of it it's actually really clear um so trying to apply it to trump was kind of nonsense especially since trump hasn't been convicted of of anything he's not 
I mean, there, there was no interact insurrection. So, so I don't know. Um, but okay. So you bring that up. I mean, it's interesting. So one of the things we know, we look at, at present events. And, and so people, this is what people have always done. Jeff has always opposed this. I've always opposed this. The idea of, of reading the newspaper and then interpreting the prophecies of the Bible based upon what you see in the news today, right? All through my history as an Adventist, I've seen people doing this. And they're always wrong, right? Now, someday they might get something right. But but they're they're always wrong because they're they're picking and choosing to interpret the prophecy based upon on the headlines of the news instead of understanding prophecy in and of itself in the whole context of prophecy. So I, I mean I don't know how many times people have since since I became an Adventist in eighty two are looking at at the news and reinterpreting some passage of scripture to fit what they see in the news today so that the Sunday law is coming really, really soon. Now, we can see that there are events that are fulfillments of prophecy. So the fall of the Soviet Union. I knew about the fall of the Soviet Union before it fell because I read about it in Louis F. Weir's uh, books. So I knew that was a fulfillment of prophecy. I was surprised with 9-11, but I saw 9-11 as a fulfillment of prophecy. But I wasn't then looking at the Sunday law just coming around the corner, because one of the things I knew is that there's a lot of things that have to happen for the world to support a Sunday law and, and for Trump to just become elected and then become a dictator and then bring in a Sunday law in the next few years, the world is not ready for that yet. Now it could be quickly if certain types of events happen, I mean, you could have some, uh, you know, Nashville being hit by a fireball or a civil war in the United States, right? Where you end up with basically a split government where some states are on one side, one on the other. I mean, that's one possibility. There's lots of different ways in which this could, uh, work itself out. But what we have to stand is, stand on is the more sure word of prophecy that is, we can, with this line upon line, understand where we are in the scheme of things, and we know that we're not to midnight yet. Now, another thing that Jeff said, just talking about Jeff, in the study, that, and I didn't watch his his presentation, but um, that he made a statement, and maybe somebody could expand on this a little bit more, but that the idea of midnight is a point in which this movement departed from the truth. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? I'm just trying to find this outline. Yeah, the introduction of midnight was a movement was hijacked. It was a hijack point going into darkness. So that's, he's going to say that then two hours and five minutes in. Um, anybody who uh, listened to his presentation so, so I don't know. Maybe I should go listen to the presentation and figure out what he's talking about there. But in the 2015, 2016 was when we had midnight introduced. And so I, I don't know his reasons because it's just like a one line here. Introduction of midnight was movement hijack point going into darkness. I would almost try to say that, that he had probably actually more have to do not just midnight, but the midnight cry. You know, Ezra 7, 9 is sort of what he pointed to before. But I'm not sure what specific aspect of it. The point that I have, you know, in context of this is that we have these lines and we are not to midnight yet because there's this work that has to be done before a Sunday law comes. We don't wait till after the Sunday law to then warn the world of the Sunday law. No, that's correct. Right. So this work has to precede it. And this movement has not done its job and is not doing its job. We, we have a lot of work ahead of us and there's a lot of more people that have to be involved in that work, definitely than just this movement, right? And, and I believe God does have people all over the world who are, you know, he has, he has his militia, so to speak, you know, waiting in the wings, people who are studying and once, once 
whatever that message, however it's going to be formed or put together, uh, starts to be understood, then the world can be warned. But the church first, and I don't mean like the organized church, but just Seventh-day Adventists, the Levites, they have to they have to take up this message. And and we're fighting against something that that the, the world is drunk with the wine of Babylon. We have all kinds of people who claim to be present truth believers of some form or other who are teaching all kinds of heresies, have all kinds of of interpretations, uh, believe that they are the ones that are going to give the message to the world. Uh, everybody's standing on their own soapbox, even within the movement itself in, in the Canadian and the U.S. groups. Everybody has a different agenda. Everybody has a different preference. There, there is no unity. There's no cohesiveness. There's no um, unity of action or purpose. It, it's just it's just confusion. So if if the first thing that we would have to do, the first work is to understand God's word correctly. So that is so that we ourselves can be can have a confidence and a faith and a trust in God in what he wants to do in us. And, and I don't see that happening. Right. I don't see that that the church or the Canadian or American groups are studying and, and coming to understand things correctly. Instead, we get confusion. We get this idea that, you know, we're not Laodiceans, we're, we're Philadelphians. It's kind of scattered, scattered stuff, scattered yeah. things. Yeah, it's scattered, but it's, it's also things that are definitely false teachings because we need to yeah. know the Laodiceans. We have to heed the message to the Laodiceans. Ellen White never asks us to heed the message to the Philadelphians. We need to know that we are Laodiceans and that it's the counsel of the true message to the Laodiceans that needs to be heeded because it is what is going to prepare us to do the work. And if we think we're not Laodiceans, if we think that just applies to the church, then we're in grave danger. Correct? Agree. Yes, definitely. I mean, I've heard of this Philadelphian idea. I had a question about this Philadelphia, but if you don't mind. I don't mind. Well, the Philadelphia, didn't it happen before they had to see him? Yeah. They didn't happen in the Millerite movement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the Millerite movement. So I would put, I would put the Philadelphia. Yeah. From, how, can it happen, how can it happen again? Well, what Jeff is doing is he's trying to apply riddle uh, of the seven kings. He's trying to apply that riddle to of the seven churches. The seven day actually he's trying to um, do it to this movement, right? All yeah, right. so he's, he's saying that we have to become Philadelphians, and and that's the eighth church. But but we don't see that. You can't just take the riddle that applies to the kings and apply it to all of the sevens, right? Well, I I, I figured this out on my own. I figured that you can't have Philadelphia when it's already been um, in history. Yeah. All right. Okay, brothers, I, I brothers and sisters, I have a, a question for each of you. In the Bible, how many times does God show his progression in prophecy or in history by going back to something? He does. Okay. And now just as just as a question. Okay. Uh, Ari, my good decided to make herself known. Just as a question, when the children of Israel were out of Egypt and Moses was on the mount, what did they want to do after Moses had been on that mount for 40 days? They wanted to go back to Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. So in this kind of a situation, yes, we need the spirit of Philadelphia the spirit of brotherly love, but how can we turn back when we're being told specifically in scripture and in the spirit of prophecy that we need the gold tried in fire, that we need the white raiment, that we need the ice out? Are we to ignore these portions of scripture and spirit of prophecy? 
Certainly not. And, and Ellen White's quite clear. I mean, the, the message of Philadelphia is that wonderful manifestation of power of the power of God in the Millerite history. And and it is true that we do. Re, we ha, have been repeating Millerite history. So that means, in a sense, you know, we could say that we've already passed through Philadelphia within this movement when we joined in the July 18, 2020 prediction, right? Because that was a, ma- a wonderful manifestation of the power of God. And it, and it did sort of unite the movement until the disappointment, just as it did in Millerite history. On the spirit of Philadelphia, right? Right. right. Yeah. But we can't say that, you know, after Laodicea, that the next church is Philadelphia and we're not, you know, we can't we can't heed the message to the Laodiceans that it doesn't apply to us because it's about the messages. These are messages to a spiritual condition. And if you're saying that I'm not a Laodicean, who are you? Let's also remember of mm-hmm. the churches that are presented before us in the book of Revelation. Mm-hmm. What number is the Laodicean church? Well, it's the seventh. So. Are we to set aside the seventh church to return to the sixth church, the sixth church being that of the number of man? Yeah, well, the thing is, it's the council. So the council of true witness to the Laodiceans applies to us. And if we if we think it doesn't apply to us, we're proving that it applies to us. Because see, if somebody says I'm rich, increased with goods and have need of nothing. They're saying uh, basically a Laodicean is somebody who thinks he's a Philadelphian, that there is no rebuke needed. So, you know, I can never accept the idea that 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 we're not Laodiceans, because if we're not, then we can't be God's people. I believe that the Laodicean church, the rebuke that's given by Christ is is the most beautiful and most powerful. Of all of the rebukes, it is the one that that transforms people when that rebuke is heeded. I mean, Christ actually stands at the door and knocks and and wants us to invite us, uh, wants us to invite him in. That's the message to the Laodiceans. There's a rebuke and a promise. And if, if I'm saying that I'm not a Laodicean, then I have no place with that promise. That promise has no place with me. It's just it's just a deception. The idea that somehow I'm okay, that's a deception. That message to the Laodiceans always has to be heeded. Jeff, you had a comment? No, no. Yeah. Just, yeah. Now, when we're when we are unwilling to heed the warnings that are given, we are then setting aside these warnings as being applying to us. Mm-hmm. We cannot afford that because then we are no better than the Jews of Christ's time and many that preceded them because they were the fourth generation. Do we wish to be of the fourth generation that we we believe we have need of nothing, that we have everything we're ever going to need? Then we are, then we we are, are the fourth, we are the fourth generation. Right. But if we believe that we have need of nothing, are yeah. we not setting aside the message of 1888, the message of righteousness by faith? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as we look at these these passages, so just to kind of give a, a clearer summary of, of what we've studied so far. So I'm, I'm going to give a more complete and simpler, hopefully clearer. So when we went back to Daniel chapter 10, right at the beginning of Daniel chapter 10, uh, what we had was this uh, in, in verse one, which I think is, is just something that we, we don't, you know, we hardly ever consider when we're looking at Daniel chapter 11, because it's going to go back to, um, the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now we know that third year is actually the third year from when Babylon falls. So it's, it's what is also called the first year. And, and remember, uh, in Daniel chapter one, it's going to say in verse, uh, 
It says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 21, um, it says, Daniel continued even unto the first year of Cyrus, right? So the question is, why is it talk about the third year of Cyrus in chapter 10, verse 1? So that means this third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that's being talked about, we understand to be actually the first year of Cyrus being the king of Babylon, right? Agreed. And so we know that this is going to be about this uh, decree of Cyrus. And that's what Daniel is, why he's mourning three full weeks. But it says there at the beginning, the thing was true. So the thing is the Debar. And the time appointed was long, right? So we got the thing, which is Debar. That's the word. That's the commandment. That's Daniel chapter 9. And the time appointed here is is not Moed, right? It's um, dealing with, you could say the conflict was great, right? So this is, um, so I'm not sure why it's translated as time appointed. I mean, it, it, it refers more to a conflict, um, like a, a military campaign. But but it can sometimes refer to like an appointed time of worship. But the fact that it's great, Gadol, means that it's probably not referring to a period of time. It's actually just referring to a conflict. So long is not a good translation of of Gadol there. And then it says he understood the thing that is the Debar. So that's the commandment. So he understood Daniel chapter nine. And then he had understanding of the vision. That's the Mare. And and what is the Mare? 2,300 days. So he understands the 70 weeks and he understands the 2,300 days. He now understands them. And because he understands them, he now knows, based upon what he had, had dealt with with the 70 years, he knows that that that, that promise of returning to the land and the rebuilding of the temple is going to happen. But Cyrus has not issued his decree yet. So Daniel's going to mourn for three full weeks, for 21 days. And, and on the 24th day of the first month, he's going to be beside the great river, which is the Hittical. That is, we normally look at the Hittical as being the Tigris River. And then he's going to uh, have this vision of Christ, Right. He's going to see Christ and Gabriel's going to explain all this stuff and that the the commandment has already gone forth. Basically, he's saying that, you know, that has been issued. So we, we I believe that Cyrus's decree is actually issued that day because that's why the angel comes to him at the end of 21 days, telling him, basically, your prayer has been answered. And then at the end of 10 verse 21, I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And, and he's going to talk before that, you know, uh, that, that Greece is going to be coming. So he's going to give them this vision of Daniel chapter 11. And so this is in the context of the 70 weeks and the 2300 days, right? That's why this is being given. Now he's going to go back in Daniel 11 verse 1 and refer back to when Babylon fell two years earlier. Right, what is called the first year of Darius the Mede. And then it says, I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. Right. So he's going to now go through the Persian kings. He's going to move into Greece and he's going to use this, this division that happens with the death of Alexander, this king of the north and the king of the south in a typical way. That is the reason that he's talking about this history is first, these kingdoms of Bible prophecy have to follow in their order, uh, but it's not going to be under Persia or under Greece that Christ is going to come. He's going to come under the time of, of, of Rome, but they're going to go through these battles between the kings of the north and the kings of the south because they become types, just as the kings of Persia become types. They're going to become types at the end of the world as well. And then we get in verse 14. In those times shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also, the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. So that means at this time, Rome is going to come, but it's not going to 
like it's going to come and conquer Greece. But what, but when it says, but they shall fall, we, we have determined that that's referring to something way in the future. And then it's going to go back, uh, talking about, um, uh, and, and, and in this history, this is going to be the Battle of Raphia where we have, uh, in connection with that history where Rome comes in, right? After the Battle of Raphia, but in connection with that. And then you're going to have the Battle of Paneum. And, the, and these battles, Raphia and Paneum, Raphia typifies 1798 and Paneum typifies 1989. And, and that's intentional in scripture. It's not, it's not something that we're just doing as an application now. It's actually the purpose and intent of this king of the north and the king of the south, because we know in Daniel 11, verse 40, that when it talks about the king of the north and the king of the south, it's going to be dealing with the time of the end in 1798, and then it's going to move to the time of the end in 1989. That's not a present truth application of the scripture. It is the application of that scripture in a historic sense following the rules of Bible interpretation of prophecy. We're not, we're not taking that and saying, well, that's a repeat of history. And so we're applying it to 1798 and 1989 in that sense, like it was something that was typical. It's what the prophecy is about, right? That's how we would understand Daniel 11 verse 40. It's giving us that history, but it's using that, those, those kings of the North and the kings of the South imagery from from the battle with Greece. So I guess I could ask you a question. Why does the scripture do it that way? Why does it use the, the literal king of the north and the literal king of the south to now be applied to a typical king of the north or to a, a, a symbolic king of the north and a symbolic king of the south? That is, you know, Rome is not literally the king of the north of Greece and France is not literally the king of the south of Egypt. And the USSR is not literally the king of the south. And the United States and the papacy are not literally the king of the north in 1989. So why does the scripture do that? Why are the kingdoms at the end of the world called Babylon? We look at the characteristics of the kingdoms, not the geograph ge uh, geographic areas. Yeah, but, but the question, what is the principle? What's the biblical principle that God is using all throughout scripture to do this? Well, spiritual application. Well, God declares the end from the beginning. Yeah. Right? So, mm -hmm. okay. So when we look at Babylon, Babylon becomes a type of the kingdoms at the end of the world because it's, it's the first kingdom. So, so all throughout scripture, God is using these, this illustration of history as prophecy. And, and we need to be clear when, when a prophecy is talking about actual history, we need to understand it's history first. That is, if we take Daniel chapter 11 and we don't correctly apply the verses to, to history, we, ju we just force some interpretation upon Daniel chapter 11 to fit some ideas we have. Then if we try to make a repeat of history, uh, we're going to get the repeat of history wrong. We're not going to understand the antitype if we don't understand the type correctly i think for the first time we're actually understanding daniel chapter 11 we spend a lot of time studying daniel chapter 11 i've spent a lot of time through my life studying daniel chapter 11 but now it really makes sense just like when we can look at revelation revelation makes sense now never used to make sense there's so many things that just didn't add up you know even five six years ago but now we can read revelation it makes way more sense daniel 11 is like that so we have this history of the king of the north and the king of the south. But the purpose of this is that Rome is going to conquer the king of the north, right? It's going to conquer the king of the north, and then it's going to conquer the king of the south. So when the king of the south comes against the papacy, who's the king of the north in 1798, it's not, it's not Egypt coming against the papacy. It's the power that is... Uh, has been typified by the king of the south. And the king of the south, and we understand, is, is referring to a spiritual application in 1798 and in 1989. And same with the king of the north. Now, the king of the north 
is is the papacy in 1798. But the king of the north is the United States and the papacy in 1989. Why is that? Why is it not just the papacy? Because we say, well, it's the papacy and the, and the United States is the armies of the king of the north. It's the armies of the papacy. But why why do we say that the United States is the king of the north? Because we're in line with Rome. Yeah, and it it has taken on the the attributes. It's gonna it's going to make an image to the beast, right? Yep. So you have in 1798, you have the papacy is conquered by France. But the United States is also rising then. It's going to be the days of one king, right? It's going to be that power. It's it's the you know the sixth kingdom, if if we wanted to count it that way. It's Rome. Rome has these three parts of the beast, uh the false prophet, and the dragon power, right? So it's going to be the United States, that's going to be the false prophet. Um, but it's going to come against the USSR, the dragon power in 1989, and it's going to uh, conquer it, so to speak. But that power doesn't disappear completely, right? Because even though the Soviet Union is defeated, we understand that, that the dragon power still is there at the end of the world. It's going to be united with the papacy in the United States. And the United States is the one that unites them, right? Because it's the United States, the false prophet, that reaches its hands across the Gulf and across the abyss to unite with these two different powers, right? It's not the papacy that reaches to the king of the South and then to the United States. It's the United States that reaches. So as we start to look at this in more details, we start to look at verse 31 and onward, we will see just how naturally these verses flow from what came before. That it's not, it's not as disjointed or as haphazard, as de- detached as we have looked at it. Because most of the time when I've looked at Daniel chapter 11, it just appears to be jumping around. But now I can see the logical flow of ideas, why things are following in the particular way. You know, so when you have a story, when you have um, a poem, a song, any kind of thing where you're communicating some kind of idea or something, there needs to be a, a logical flow. A painting, you know, even if you look at a painting, your eye's going to follow through that painting in a certain way so you see things in the way that the artist wants you to see them, right? And God has has painted this picture for us in prophecy, and we've not been looking at it correctly. But we haven't seen what this story is about and why it's given in the way that it is. And I think now we can. We can see why each, and I've asked often, you know, why is this verse here? Why does it say this? Why is it telling us this information in particular? There has to be a reason for it. And, and even though we can make a present truth application of Daniel chapter 11, I think the most important thing we learned is that how we're studying even the historical application relates to our time, that its purpose is for us at the end of the world to understand Daniel chapter 11. Because the prophecies, every prophecy of scripture is given for who? Who's it given for? Those at the end of the world. It can't fully be understood, definitely couldn't be understood in the second century B.C., Daniel chapter 11 was given for us. And so we need to, we need to understand it. Okay. Let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the study today. We pray that uh, as we come together tomorrow, uh, that you can help us to see these things much more clearly. And we pray for each person. We pray for our families, uh, our friends, those we come in contact with. We pray for this movement and the people in it. And we ask, Lord, that you can use us to your glory. Uh, Thank you for the things you teach us and help us to learn of Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.